Medicine was the economic one. Now, the first uh, person uh, to uh, speak is Bruce Evans, who is a colleague from Norway. He specializes in rural development in Norway, essentially in its cultural aspects, social aspects. He is interested in the horrors uh, over a number of years now, particularly equestrian tourism but also in uh, horse breeding. So he will uh, speak to us of a theme which is extremely interesting on the problem of the horse in Norway. Riz, it's all yours. Thank you very much. I wished I would have heard that before. I would love to answer the questions you just raised in my presentation. <laughs> but instead, ah, thank you. I will tell you a little bit about this project, and we can always talk about externalities and some of those other questions um, later. The project called Riding Native Nordic Breeds, or Riding Native Breeds as we call it as a shorthand, is uh, something that I'm doing with two other people here at the conference, and that's Gudrun Hel Helg's, Helg's daughter, who you heard earlier, and Inga, who will be speaking tomorrow. Uh, they're from Iceland. I'm from Norway. We also have a partner on the Faroes Islands. The project is funded by the North Atlantic Opportunities Fund. It's a two-year project, and as we were told when we applied, this isn't research, this is a business development project. So we went and we crossed out the word research and we put in business development. And we were successful. <laughs> Our specific focus is on the native breeds in the Nordic periphery, in the North Atlantic periphery. And that's three regions. First is Western Norway, and the reason why Western Norway is because that's the only part of Norway that qualifies for Nora funding. Also Iceland and the Faroes Islands. And these three areas each have their own native breed horse. The Iceland horse, the Faroes horse, and the Fjord horse in Norway. We also have industry partners who are development agencies, either in the local municipality or département and some tourism businesses as well. So each of our partners has an interest in developing economic activity with one of these native breeds. So what's really the point of this research? Well, native breed horses were bred, in, in the case of the ones we're looking at, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years to help people make a living off the land. They weren't bred like sport horses. They were bred to be efficient, to be tough, to be hardy, to produce wealth off the land. And of course, along come the tractors in the middle of the 20th century. And on these native breeds and many others, the population numbers go way down. And only now are they coming back up. Uh, and Really, that's because there was no economic imperative to keep these breeds of horses. If you can't make money with a horse, I mean, people will still keep the horses, but not so many. And so in order to counter this decline in breed numbers, we have to find new economic imperatives to keep these native breed horses. And that's what this project is about. We're looking at one particular economic activity, which is equine tourism, as a reason to continue having fjord horse, to continue having the Faroese horse, to con well, we don't have to worry about continue having the Iceland horse. They've already, <laughs> they're already on that one, okay? So we want to develop these new economic imperatives to support the flourishing of the breeds in the 21st century. And I think this is a really important part, point that we often don't emphasize. 
We need to think about horses in the 21st century. And very often, we think about them in the 20th century. What will be new? What are the new possibilities? What are the new rural economies? And that's, this project is one small attempt to get at this. Now, what's interesting also about native breed horses is that they are as, how can I put this? They are bred with as much care and detail as modern sport horses. But they're bred for a very different purpose. But just like modern sport horses, they are a socio-technical construct. It's the combination of the genes of the horse and the aspirations of the human beings that makes these horses what they are. Because on the Faroe Islands, the farmer will say, oh, I don't want that horse. It can't live outside all winter. I'm not going to let it breed. This one's really strong. We'll breed this one. Etc. 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 Yeah. So the breeding of native breed horses is certainly in the Nordic native breeds is all about linking it to the geography, to the landscape, to the environment in which these horses and the people who keep them have to live. They have to be able to live and work hard in a cold, mountainous, harsh land. And so they're selected for working strength. If you see, for example, the Faroese horse, it's all front because its life is about pulling things. It doesn't do any jumping. You know, you can see it in their conformation in some cases. And some of these horses, many of these horses, will live outside all winter without a blanket and even without supplementary feeding. And that's what their value is. Now, there's, a, there's all sorts of interesting things about these native breeds in the Nordic periphery. One is their origin stories, because everybody tells different stories about the same horses. Oh, they came from Norway. No, they didn't. They're Celtic. Oh, well, you Norwegians, you got them from Finland. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting, because, of course, when we talk tourism, the stories matter. When we're talking cultural heritage, those histories are part of what is being marketed here. So this is one of the interesting things we're, we're picking up on. Another interesting thing is, is that, just think about this. Horses got to Iceland around 1,000 years ago. They came on boats, those open Viking boats. Imagine taking horses in an open boat with a sail for three or four weeks in the North Atlantic and getting to the other end and the horse is still alive. Pretty amazing technological accomplishment. Yes. Um, so there's, all, there's, there's so many things woven into these breeds. Now, the project, one of the reasons we have the three islands is we're able to look at using native breed horses at three scales, at a macro scale, at a meso scale and at a micro scale. In Iceland, there are, um, there are many, many horses. This figure is the wrong figure on here, isn't it? It's 2.4 horses per, per person in the municipality of Skagafjordur. This one's right, 1 1.2, okay. We have many different scales of measuring here. But what it means is there's a lot of horses. If you go to a farm in this area and you say to the farmer, how many horses do you have? He goes, mm, about 100. 100? Oh, well, I'm not sure. It might be 105. You know, I haven't counted them right lately. When you go trekking on a two or three day trek with 10 people, you will take 40 or 50 horses. And just as you saw with Guthrun's talk about the roundup, having that many horses makes a real impact on what you do as horse tourism, when you have so many. So we have this interesting macro scale example. And then in Norway, we have a medium scale where we, there's quite a few fjord horse and everybody knows about them, except for last year, there were less than 200 fjord horse born in Norway. 
less than 200 folds. So there's a crisis coming on there. And in the Pharaoh's Islands, there are only 62 Pharaoh's horse left. And that's double what it was 15 years ago. So they're almost extinct and are coming back from the brink. So this has all sorts of interesting implications for equine-based tourism. You know, as I said, lots of horses in Iceland. In Norway, there are a few tourist businesses, and we hope there will be more, especially if we can hook up with the international market. But there are a lot of problems. And in the Faroes Islands, you can't use 62 horses for a trekking business. So they have to come up with another way of dealing with them. And this is kind of what we learned. On the Faroes, we went there on our first visit, and they, the people who are our partners have been trying to save the Faroese horse, paying out of their own pocket to helicopter a stallion over to another island to breed. And they've been ignored by the government. And so we went in there and we said, well, what's, you know, what is going on here? And we came up with this idea of um, uh, what you could call um, uh, endangered species tourism. Because the Faroes Islands gets 50 cruise boats a year and they don't know what to do with the people on the cruise boats. So our partners are going to build a breed center and bring people in on coaches, and they won't ride the horses. They'll go and look at them and pay a little money to save this sturdy little horse. And uh, they've just, we just, we just had an email uh, last week that our partners have won a, what is it, 45,000 kroner environmental award to help save the horses. So they are starting to work on this endangered species tourism. However, when we went around the Faroes Islands, when we interviewed somebody, they said, well, what are you guys doing with a Faroes Island horse? Why don't you get an Iceland horse? They're better anyway. And that's one of the problems you face in the 21st century. Yeah. <laughs> so interesting times. In Norway, what we discovered was a lot of problems. Our partner is the Fjord Hesta Center, which is the breed center for fjord horses. And they actually operate tourism themselves. They do a lot of... Um, uh, what we call shorting, driving, well, using wagons. And, but they have some problems because they don't, they don't dominate the breed. They, they have a breed book, a stud book in Norway. There's a different one in Canada. There's more, no, no, more fjord horse in Canada than there are in Norway. So they have all sorts of little problems. And uh, <coughs> of course, Norwegians are very wealthy and they don't need horses. And they're looking for novelty, so what do they do? They buy Iceland horses. Uh, and so there's lots of interesting issues about, um, you know, why don't we support our local native breed? Well, we're modern, so we're getting mixed messages in Norway. The other interesting thing about tourism we found in Norway is safety. In this image here, there's a famous glacier up in one of the fjords called uh, Birkdal, Birkstol. And they used to take people from the cruise ships on horses. And about 15 years ago, the horse went off the road and killed two people. And now they use something that is called troll cars made by John Deere. Uh, so there are some issues about safety and security and tourists, which uh, in the Norwegian case have to be addressed and dealt with. Yeah. And especially because Norway is a society that involves a lot of regulation. What we find in Iceland is indeed very different. You know, we have a flourishing industry. I'm sure as you'll hear tomorrow, we could flourish more. But it sure looks good from the Norwegian perspective or from the Faroes Islands perspective. And indeed, it is growing and um, uh, beginning to manifest in different ways, um, more, more judging, more breeding, more export. And of course, as we all know, they maintain total control of the beer, breed. Not only is no horse allowed to go to I Iceland, but if an Iceland horse leaves, it can never go back. So there's really interesting issues about control there. So um, you'll hear more about Iceland tomorrow. So we'll, I've just been given the, the two minute mark here. This project raises a lot of really interesting questions. Like what is so attractive about a native breed anyways? 
And why do tourists like to link the breed to the landscape? Another interesting question is, do the qualities and characteristics for which these horses were bred, are they suitable for tourism? In some cases, they may very well be, and in other cases, maybe not. But um, that's a question I think we need to ask more, more generally. What is a horse that's suitable for tourism? What kinds of business activities can be developed with these? How can the quality of the tourist experience be improved? And more importantly, how can the income of the tourism operator be improved? These are the things that we're basically working on in this project. We're halfway into it. Um, we've been doing things like building a best practice guide, gathering everybody's examples. We'll be putting them all together and making them more generally available and learning from each other. A couple of interesting things we've learned. It looks like the number of horses determines the kind of activities that are possible. So scale is important. And we've learned that networking is important as well. Horse people tend to be really good at horses, not so good at marketing not so good sometimes at people management. So if we can work together, we can make synergies and work uh, to make it much more successful. Basically, what we're saying is, is the management of the business of native breed equine tourism requires new skills, new insights, and new ways of organizing the sector. And we hope by the end of the project to have some solid suggestions on how that can be done. Thank you.